Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see you at the morning. The well, last morning of the conference, I associate with desertion. Uh, so to see so many of you here uh, this morning is fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Matt Wickman. I'm a professor of English at BYU. Uh, interested very much in spirituality. I'm so grateful to uh, Bo, Karen Lee, and the entire team who has put together a really just top-notch, first-rate conference. It's been wonderful, very inspirational. And it's my uh, deep pleasure to be here with my friend, uh, Patrick Saint-Jean, who is uh, the one who is going to be speaking with us. He asked me to do some interviewing here to present ideas that way as opposed to just straight lecture. Uh, but it will be, uh, he'll be leading us, uh, guiding us to meditation at the end of this hour. Uh, which will be wonderful. Um, and what I want to do for structure this morning, I'll do structure and then we'll do a brief introduction of Patrick and then we'll get into our conversation. Patrick and I are going to talk for about 30 minutes, about 9.35, at which point there'll be about 10 minutes for you to ask questions of Patrick uh, if you are so inclined uh, or to make comments and things he has to share. And then at 9.45, we'll go to our meditation. And then the session ends at 10 o'clock. Um, Patrick, uh, many of you had a chance to have a talk to Patrick at the conference. Uh, if you haven't, I hope that you will enjoy uh, what you're in for this morning. Uh, he is a very um, uh, interesting and inspired person. Uh, he is a uh, member of the Society of Jesus. He's from Haiti, uh, presently a, a professor of psychology at Creighton University. Uh, he has degrees from universities in, in France and Mexico and the United States, and he writes at least one book a year, which makes me terribly jealous. And, um, uh, and, and, and he is really a, a, a radiant personality and a real delight. So, Patrick, it's great to have you here. So I'm just going to begin. Um, this is one of Patrick's recent books. Uh, it's titled The Crucible of Racism. Uh, Ignatian Spirituality and the Power of Hope. The main book we'll be talking about this morning is a book published the previous year called uh, The Spiritual Work of Racial Justice, A Month of Meditations with Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, these are both fantastic books. I highly recommend them to you. I'll just begin this way, Patrick, asking you a bit about your, your um, educational background and your journey, right? So again, you're from Haiti, educated in France, Mexico, United States. You know, uh, you are the study of Jesus, you teach psychology, you write about nation spirituality and anti-racism. Did you go back about 10 years? Did you have any sense for where you'd be at this point in your life? In other words, are you reaching a goal that you set and you felt inspired to set a long time ago? Or has your journey surprised you kind of step by step along the way? Thank you very, very much, Matt. Once, once again, thank you to each and every one of you here because I think without you, I, would, I wouldn't be here. Thanks, Matt, again, and Bo. They trust me that much, you know. You people, you really, like, you take a big guess. You trust a Jesuit. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> um, I believe that, number one, I would say it's about, it's a grace because born in a Southern Baptist family in Haiti, then five years old to move out in, in France, just like enjoy life. I never know what is coming tomorrow. Just the sense of grace and wonder with the spirit. Fast forward means I went to a Jesuit high school in Montpellier where I grew up. That's how I met the Jesuit, enjoyed the life one guy who is, was like Father, Father Moko, who was my best friend in the school. I was the only black boy and one about like 1,500 1, boys schools in the Jeju school in the town. And then Father Moko, who was like 80 years old, was my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> we had fun. Means like, but that's through Father Moko, I understand and I get to know the society. My parents would have fight in, enough to not let me see him on the weekend because there is no school. But I create a pretext. I get, I go to a conservatory just to see Father Mo every day. I think those things have really, really changed me. One thing I learned from Father Mo, he said, "You know why? God is with you every day and live life every day." 
That's what I do, and that's what brings me here. And the second aspect of it, I think I truly believe that is the... Ignatius was quite very bold in life with all his all experience. He really did not settle for what's coming in 10 years and five years. But he challenged, you see, why don't you challenge yourself to find God today? And that will be enough. That's what I do. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Find God today. And the third aspect of it is about like discernment. Whenever, in the discernment of the spirit, Ignatius always said, you know why? We can pray, trust God, make the decision today. Then we can always reevaluate if we have to when we get tomorrow. That's the principle of my life. That's what I gain from the Jesuit, and that's what I get also from my family. Very, very growing up, and that's what I do as I speak to you today. Okay, that that principle of being present to God, right, and being present in today, uh, and following God today, reevaluating tomorrow if you need to, is a very important one. You clearly lived your life by that. I'm wondering then how. This next question, in, your, in this book right here, The Crucible of Racism, um, you discuss your conversion uh, and the impetus to join the Jesuits. But you also discuss, really in painful detail, the racism that you encountered when you came to the United States, including from other Jesuits. And uh, can you briefly describe that experience and that painful awakening into a present you could not have wanted? Thank you very much, means. I like my Matt, he's one of my best friends, but sometimes I say, Matt, can you slow it down a little bit? <laughs> you always get the best out of me even whenever I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> my ancestors arrived here in this part of the world. Means in the 1720, 1726, right here, they were in Louisiana. Fast forward, they got bought on the auctions in the same year, in the 1736. In fact, by one of the preacher from the Princeton plantation. Princeton, in fact, my ancestors are one of the slaves who were born here on these plantations. And I don't know why Bo invited me here. I didn't. <laughs> and then, fast forward. That's where my great grandfather learned to read and write as a slave here. Then get very, very close to his owner. The owner right now, parenthesis, and Haiti there is one of the uh, underground migration that understood it. Because when everything was happening, Haiti took their independence in 1804. When everything was happening in the US, whenever your husband, could have could get money simply to get you either to Maryland or to Louisiana. The Haitian government, the new free land, simply put you on the boat, they will pay the boat. You get there, they give you equivalent of about a thousand dollars, they give you lands. All of those slaves from the south automatically made it to Haiti. You become middle class and free people, even though your husband is still in slavery in the U.S. There are many, many, many slaves who end up made it to Haiti at that time. Fast forward, we become like in 1876. That's how once the same slaves owner from Princeton plantations were doing like some medical and evangelization like trips in Haiti with my parents or to some part of my families, that's how they end up making it to Haiti. That's after about 100 years plus. Guess what happened to the world? Unfortunately, maybe I was born. <laughs> <laughs> then being born Kind of like this hybrid things somehow. We, my mother always said, like, you know, I, we and this family, we are confused because from US, France, Haiti, and then from Senegambia, 
in Africa where our woods come from. We really don't know what's going on. That's how I end up making it. But I was always a very, very happy child. Loved, cared, really embraced by my family, in a family of like preachers. And always I found myself in the church. I Means I at 11 years old, I was a little preacher in the Baptist church. I Means life was, for me, just okay. Then all of a sudden, there is something that was cooking, if you will, in my life. I've never paid attention. I did not know. Until to a certain point, because my mother was born here in New Jersey, because I still have the root of this family from here. They're still living here right now in New Jersey City, in Orange County, and so on and so forth. But there is some things I did not know until when I made it here. It's until also when I joined the Society of Jesus. I didn't know that I was a black man. That's one of the things I would say to a certain point as a gift I get from my land because part of my blood is still here in America. And there is a grace also I get from the Society of Jesus. It's being a black man. Okay, right. In fact, there would be a question I would ask about this, but for one, a time I'll go to another question. But I do want to touch on something you write in this book, which I think is really profound. If you want to comment, feel free, of course. If not, I'll ask you another question. But you write this. Um, hey, why don't you just write this paragraph right here? You want to read it for you, us? You, you I'll, I'll, okay, I'll read it. Uh, to be black in America means to find yourself in a position where you have to justify yourself in order to exist. Ironically, through this painful undertaking, the Jesuits taught me to recognize and claim my black identity. Today, I consider this to be the deepest spiritual experience I have ever had, full of grace and challenges. That's our human existence. To a certain point, uh, unfortunately, I, I say that sometime, we black in this part of the land, uh, to a certain degree, we say thank you to many white people because for who they make us become. Because in the black diaspora, we often take for granted this richness of who we are, our culture, our experiences, our resilience, our humanness, and we forget that we're black. This is the only white space where constantly you have to remind people of your existence simply by being say, hey, I'm here and I'm human. That's the only one of the few places in the world where human is somehow an oxymoron or exi human, you know, existential oxymoron. I have to say, hey, I'm a human like you. Can you see me? That's the contrast you're living in human life in the U.S. Somehow, I think like Haley Douglas Brown put it very well, America is a white space where black bodies are not welcome. And we even find that within our church, our church where if ever you are welcome, but how many of us belong? That's a, that's a great distinction, welcome versus belonging. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, actually, um, and touch on this, because you write something in another book that I want to I wanna bring up for the group here and have you comment on it. First, let me ask you a more general question about that other book. We're turning here to the book now, uh, The Spiritual Work of Racial Justice, A Month of Meditations with Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, it's such a great book. And as you point out, it's, it's not so much a book to read as much as it's a work to do. It's like a you like it to a car manual, uh, which I think is a great uh, analogy. It's really it's a book to think with and work with and meditate to. Um, but you, I'm curious about how that book comes about. How did you think to make the connection between the Ignatian exercises and the work of anti-racism? As such a as such a brilliant intuition, really inspiration. How did this come to you? 
Matt, when you are working, you got lost, you have to find your way out. The slave did it. They found themselves here many years ago. They got lost in this land. They create life to, they create space to live. And ever, more than ever, means like black, brown body on this land has always been beings of like survival. That's what like, you know, Tony Morrison said like, no, surviving is important, but thriving is alien. That's how black and brown body has learned to thrive despite everything that has happened. That's how these books come about. Oftentimes, you know, this, they often say like this expression, Re all research is me search. <laughs> That's how this book come because I was, I was working in a different book, which by the way, I'm yet to put out. I, won't, I was working I'm quite like very, very heady. Many other books that I publish in French and Portuguese and Spanish, they are more kind of like academic book. I didn't want to put myself on these things. Why are you those people that have popular writing? What is that gonna be? I want to be like, you know, it's academic pen, just even though two people read my books, but I do something. That's what was my thought, really. I was working to this transversal biography between Ignatius of Loyola, Franz Fanon, and James Baldwin. I put them in communication about like this notion of race in America. I get the books almost like 99% complete just I print to send out. About after something that happened in my community at three in the morning, I poured myself I reaping, just I just I crushed everything, just I put it in the trash. And within six weeks, I found myself with this book, The Spiritual Exercises. And somehow, to a certain degree, I see that I was writing the books, but Ignatius himself was the one who was like editing the whole book. It's, it's not a book, like you mentioned earlier, it's not something you're going to have to take it and just put it in your pocket, but rather it's a work to do. Whether or not you're white, black, brown, wherever you are, you profess a certain type of faith or none, this is an invitation to you. At least that's what it is for me. And I couldn't get any things really as a Jesuit, as a black Jesuit myself to pray with. I could not get any things in my... Ignatian spirituality, the spiritual exercise has been one of the greatest gifts Ignatius of Loyola has given to the church. Why we never had anything? That's how this project come about. Okay, it, it's such a, it's such a great story um, that you had this other book that was just about done an academic book on a great topic, but academic, and then you kind of put that away, and then within six weeks you had something totally different. Because I've, I've not read the book unpublished book. But I've read the spiritual exercises book that you wrote, and it really is a product of such inspiration. You write something in there, though, I find really sobering and a little devastating. I want to I want to read this, uh, and then have you maybe comment on it for us. Um, here it is. I'm quoting you uh, from that book. One second here. You write surveys conducted by the Public Religion Research Institute found that white Christians including evangelical Protestants, mainline Protestants, and Catholics, are almost twice as likely as whites without a religious affiliation to say police violence against blacks are isolated incidents rather than evidence of a pattern. Why does it seem especially difficult for white Christians in particular uh, to wrap their minds around structural racism or to learn how to see it? Number one, I think for us in the church, we are really like suffering. Number one, we are suffering of what I call in my work as a crisis of a spiritual imagination. That's one of the major crises we are suffering in the church as Christians. Because of our whiteness, in fact, our whiteness has become norm. What is, whoever is white, 
He's who will always be right. Number two, unfortunately for us, the way we imagine we can see Christ, Christ is only white. And white has become this veil that we have. This is why James Baldwin said that on the essay he wrote for New York Times in 64. He said, if you could only take your time to see, the, to see me, which is like the undercurtain of my skin, you could realize that I'm just someone like you. We, the veil that we have on our eyes does not allow us to see under that. And the fourth point, it's also like pseudo-Christian comfort. This is why, perhaps, this is why we, you see that we are all, almost all of us, we are like so obsessed about like working in, means working in shelters, so kitchen, maybe that's the case, because we always see the Catholic Church as a shelter, where we, all of us go in and we find shelters. We are so comfortable. Somehow, in the church, somehow, we, we, white Christian has become for us like, is it, never, never land, if you will. We are all like, want to be cozy, quiet, in our like, comfortable place. We don't want to be bothered by the others inside, outside. Yet, I don't know, I might be wrong. I don't know if really Christianity is about comfort, comfortability. Maybe, I don't know, it means I've been, I was born in the church. I have two masters in theology, I'm a religious. I've been like in this business for a while. I have not read this page yet. I don't know, man. I'm young. I'm very dumb, young. Probably that's the cause. I don't know if Christianity is about comfortability. <laughs> Our ch Christian church today has become really like a place where all of those zombies, we are Christian zombies. We all of us, every Sunday, we go in and fool the church. Yet we all, we know, we always go. You see, whenever we go, we receive communion. We get the cups. We look at ourselves and the cups. Ooh, how great thy art. Thanks, God. <laughs> That's where we are today. And yet, those outside, I don't care about you. That's interesting. You know, I, I associate my own faith with comfort and consolation, certainly on the one end, but there's another side to it. It's about taking up your cross, right? Which is very rigorous and often very painful uh, and requires a great deal of discipline and dedication, sort of discipleship. Let me ask you about this. Um, one of the parts of your book that really struck me is your observation that what you call disordered affections, uh, which is like wrong attitudes and wrong perspectives about racism in particular, that these disordered affections, you write, separate us from one another as much as they separate us from the divine. Now, I wonder if you can elaborate. Say I'm somebody who never says racist things. You know, I, I, I don't hold racist attitudes, but I also don't think much about matters of race. I don't think much about anti-racism. How is my life disconnected from sort of matters of race, still a life of disordered affection? That's a very, very deep, complex question, man. Thank you very, very much. There are many, many layers into it. Number one, let's go to the theological part of it. In moral theology, we have one of the type of like sin we call like capable ignorancy. Now, hold on people, the Bible people, we know that, right? In the Bible, God's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Knowledge is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We are to know. Church people, are we here, church? Amen? Amen. We have to know. If you choose to not know, you're going to have to talk to God. You choose to not know how to care, how to love your brother. That's what we call like one of the sins in moral theology. Capable ignorance. 
That's one of the layers of the questions here. Remember, and then you just choose to not, you know, we talk about all the time, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Knowledge is one of them. Second, now, the spiritual part of it is the way Ignatius really, like, you know, talk about, like, pay attention to the spirit of all of those, like, disordered affections. In this context of healing, race, and racism in America, whiteness has become one of our disordered affections. In fact, for us Christians, it's become an idol. We worship whiteness. We pray to it. Oh, how beautiful you are. God love you. Oh my God, I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't be anyone else, anything other than white. Then, that's against that where we so, I mean, it's like there is a certain like intimacy, so obsessed about this. That's how it's become like something that put us away from God. Anything that we see that leading us away from God is not of God, questions ourselves. Now, I know in this book and many works, and I often like focus deeply on notion like contrast between white and black and brown, right? That's not per se the reality, yet I know that's one of the old-fashioned ways to engage with this conversation. There, is many, many, there are many, many other layers into it. it means like, just bear with me, the, this language. But the experience here, what I point here, this sense of like disordered affection is like where we did that we are not paying attention to what attract us and where what is attracting us and is leading us. That's where the major issue comes from here. Okay, all right. I should mention, uh, like an Ignatian spiritual program for the exercises, there are four weeks of, of uh, exercises and then two more days, the so 30 days you give us. The weeks are um, in order, uh, week one, the sin of division, week two, Christ as a person of color, week three, the crucifixion and the suffering of people of color, and week four, resurrection and the power of possibility. Um, and I, I want to just maybe I'll ask you this one question and then we'll kind of turn over to the, the audience if they have questions for you too. These weeks have exercises that you, uh, that you give to us. These can be um, meditations, journaling, um, you know, sort of prayers. How did you devise the exercises that accompany uh, these weeks of, 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 of this program? Uh, how did you come to these exercises? Because I, again, I and students of mine who've done this have found them to be very powerful. How did you come to these exercises in particular? That's particular, particular things that you have us do in the book. Of my own suffering. I think the experience of it really, again, this book really come out from many experiences of prayers and also a lot of like suffering and pain sometime part of my life in my formation of my time as a Jesuit. I was completely like confused. I did not know what to do. But also the other layers also, the, the exercise in itself were already like divided in four weeks, the way Ignatius like offered them to us. But the subdivisions within each weeks I lay down within days, which like is how I learn and go through the exercises. And I found, I found, okay, there is like what would be fit with this one. The methodology in itself, I play out of it like as I was like going through the books again. I'm very, very grateful to God using like Ignatius to edit it, to make, become one of my first editor in this book. That's Ignatius' job. That's not my job. And I'm very, very grateful to him. But it's the tools that I think is inviting us. But one point I want to quickly fast forward to make on this here, it's about like racism really as not only the sin on um, somehow the aff affection disorder we use in our own life, but we all have forgotten how also racism is a sin of division. It's pulling us away from God. 
And this is why Ignatius, like including on the, on the rules for discernment, he said, pay attention to anything that's not leading to God. And we are praying every day. We are aware of this is not leading to God. Yet, yet, we so attached to it. To a certain point, also, is a crisis of freedom. That's where, that's what we like cause us, challenge us today in, in this part of the world. We have this lack of freedom whenever we engage in this question of race and racism. And then lastly, I think Ignatius really like offer us a gift from the Christian church and the church at large. It's how to be human. Just like Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, you are right. We have to. We have forgotten how to be human for each other. But five hundred years ago, Ignatius offered us something like that, and here we are today as we speak. The exercises, what make them like so important, powerful? It's because they come from from Ignatius' own pain and suffering that today intersect with the pain and suffering of us human and come here with in this part of the world, meet us in our own pain and suffering. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, we have 10 minutes to, where you can pose questions uh, to Patrick before we move to his, the meditation that he guides for us. And you have, a, you have a question, you have a microphone, so I, okay, so that, okay. Yeah, Philippe will bring this around to whoever wants to ask after me. First of all, Patrick, thank you for your beautiful, brilliant, and important work. Profoundly grateful for what you bring to us. Um, and thank you, Matthew, for drawing that out in, in our friend. So I, I understand and I know how this beautiful work comes out of suffering, and I'm so struck by how you said um, it's in white spaces that I realize that I'm black and I have to remember the gift of being black, but that also is a place of pain. So my, my question for you is how do you get to the place where you're not resentful of having to be reminded constantly that you have to defend your humanity. How, because you're so full of joy, you're so luminous, you're so full of joy. How did you move from that pain and the surprise and the shock, which could lead to resentment and dejection, how did you get from pain to seeing it as a gift that the white environment can become, a, that the pain can become a gift because it can help me reclaim the beauty of blackness? or for me, Asian-ness, or, so how, how did you cultivate, how did God cultivate the joy and the hope in you rather than the pain, resentment, and bitterness? Because many people doing justice work get so angry, and it's the anger and resentment that drive them, and where do you get to the joy? So how do you get that joy? Thank you very, very much, for really appreciate these questions. Um, I think number one, I often like say, you know why, this type of work, I don't know how, I have many colleagues that I talk to, I don't know how they engage in this work without praying. There cannot be healing works that goes out of prayer. Justice, healing, it is spiritual work. In fact, this is why this book called like, The Spiritual Work of Justice. Because it's a work of God. It's a work of God. Now, there is not, don't take me wrong here, that doesn't mean that those who are doing it yet, to a certain point, hasn't reached this level yet, they are doing it out of God. That's not what I want to say. But there is something deeper into this. It's detachment. It's not my work. How can you engage with it with freedom? There is a certain like spiritual detachment that has to be into it. Today, I mean, interestingly enough, you know, I'm a grown man in my 30s. I publish, I do everything. 
It's a very simple example, right? But to come here, I had to get permission from my superior. Everything that I'm publishing, I'm seeing everything. I have to get permission from my superior. But if one day also I wake up and say, no, I'll be the happiest guy in the world. This is not my work. The body of Christ, as we speak today, is wounded. The body of Christ we are receiving every day has a big wounds. It's a wound of racism. Racism is one of the wounds that infect and fester in the body of Christ. Yet, each time we approach into it, we get close into it. We try to just take Christ from the wounds. Take Christ from the pen. That's not the history of Christianity. <clears throat> Mary, mother of Christ, very, very clear. Ignatius, you know, in the exercise, he said, like, Mother Mary asked you, just come be with Mary at the feet of the cross. Not to take Jesus from the cross. Don't try to take Jesus' business from Jesus. Don't try to take God out of Jesus. That's what we try to do all the time as Christians. Hmm. This is why we say that, you know, how dare you, Christ would have never been like appear on the black face, on the Asian face, on the brown face. Christ must always be white. That's when we are taking God out of Christ. Is a freedom, detachment, and allow God be God. And the last point of it, really, it's about this fourth week of the exercises. Once you go deeper in the exercises, where Ignatius challenge us to know, living with tension. And the fourth week of the exercises, if you familiar with it, where Ignatius said, you know, I thinking with the church. Is living with tensions. Ignatius, when he was like really painful on his bed in Manresa, recuperating after the bullet, he looked up and down. He hadn't, didn't have any choice but give the pain and suffering where it's come from. He said, take Lord and receive. All my memories, my pain, my joy, Give me only your love and your grace, and that's enough for me. A quick story to add to what you just said, Bo, your question, about, about this being God's work that Patrick is doing. Um, when I first approached Patrick to be a, a podcast host titled Faith and Imagination, I knew he was very busy. So when he came on, I said, well, thank you for doing this. He said, I felt I had no choice. I felt that God prompted me to do this. So if I ever ask any of you to be on the podcast, think twice about saying no, right? <laughs> yeah. um, time for one more question before the meditation. Um, thank you so much, Patrick, um, for this space. My name is Uzuma. I'm from Nigeria. Part of the problems we suffer from Africa, when we come to actually, the first time I knew I was a black woman was when I came to America. It was not from the white people it was from the African-Americans, the black people like me. How do you deal with the pushing you away as the ones who sold the black people to wherever? How do you deal with the African-Americans not welcoming you because you're from Africa? How do you deal with that? And then the second thing, how do, you come, how do you deal with thinking because you have an accent, you're less intelligent? How do you deal with that? Because your accent doesn't mean how much intelligence or wise or gracious you are. It's just the way you speak. That's the first thing you know, how to speak like a Nigerian woman. Blessed. Amen. <laughs> so, how? Do you deal, that, these are two questions. How do you deal with ask, everybody asking you, where are you from? You have an accent. What does that mean? That you have an accent? Then my final question is, 
how do you deal with the people we call the Pentecostal churches? We pray in tongues. We can do everything. But we are not welcomed in the space of Christ, in the church. You are not judging. If you say anything, don't judge the church. But the church is in trouble. The church is wounded. How do you deal with that? Thank you. Matt, you want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> Microphone off. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Really appreciate this question. We thank you very, very much. I really appreciate that. Um, healing work is a work of Christ. It's not our work. And it's always reminding, you know, we are dealing with one another. Do your best, even though the other tried or might have some point they got stuck or some blindness. But we are always called to be very, very patient and careful and do our best to always give others what you feel like they ha that has been denying to you. My whole life has been like growing up the unfolding and white space. And my grandmother, by the way, who is like that, she was my backbone, my complete everything in my entire life. My grandmother really said, you know why? When they beat you, give them a hug. The complexity between notions of this internal conflict we have within black, black, brown, brown in this country, including also a white, white, again, it's his human mystery. It's a human experience. If we go back, back home in Africa, Nigeria, Congo, we will find it also, some of the other spaces. How can we engage in these interactions with one another as human? How can I pray, God, give me your love and allow me to be tender as you were tender when you give hug with Peter? You give Peter a hug as Peter denied you on the cross. That's where we engage here. Again, this is a work of healing. And whenever we engage in work of healing, we engage with the work of mystery and the mystery of human beings. <laughs> Patrick is a wonderful uh, person, as you can tell. A real blessing. Thank you, Patrick. We'll move down to the meditation part of the hours out. Um, I will invite you. Oh. Oh, that's disappear. That's okay. <laughs> I thought it was still here. Um, I'm going to invite you right now, perhaps, to try to find yourself in a comfortable place and space. If you have some things in your hands, maybe you might want to put it somewhere. Um, if you feel comfortable, you might just like allow your two feet to be on the ground, standing, and feel that you're here. The space is important. That's where we meet God. And the place is important because that's where we've been invited to be with God. Just allow yourself to be grounded here when we're on the ground. And it's a type of like blessings and grace. We say thanks to God for this. There is one of the little gifts I found in my annual retreat. We call it like the examine has been coming in many, many layers. One of the way I found also myself, I pray the examine is my fingers. I call it like the finger examine. By the way, I just, aside marketing, I put that in one of my books that's coming with board leaf in October. Just save some money so that you can get it. 
<laughs> but the finger examine is very interesting how Ignatius like invite us to follow the examine with like five step, right? And then we happen to have only five fingers in our hands. That makes it so interesting. That's been you cannot have a pretext that you don't want to pray. If you're on the train, if you're like walking out, you're, you're just like on a walk, you can simply do the exam and just simply by your fingers. But another layer as I add into it is a finger breathing exam. Each one of those places is one of the steps of the exam where we're gonna follow right now. And I would go here, I would first invite you in the beginning to have a grace. Then based on this grace, and then we're going to ask God to shape it one way. Each one of those will be one step. When I go up, I will breathe in. When I breathe in, I breathe from my jack, jack from here. Just in the point, you can do this exercise. We're going to go together, we breathe in. Okay, I close my mouth, but I breathe from my nose. And then when I breathe out, Okay, I go breathe in from up to down. And I pause here. And then when I go down here, out. Okay, and I pause down on the base again. And I breathe in from here. I will pause here. And I go down again. And I go keep going in. And I'm gonna pause here again. And, and so on and so forth. But I'm gonna go slow. Go as you spill, the spirit is guiding you. Number two, this exercise is one of the exercises that invites you to engage in this free space with this spirit. I'm going to invite you in the second aspect right now, perhaps that might be for the first time in the whole week, in the whole month, or maybe for this whole day. You're going to ask yourself permissions. I know wife is important, children is important, husband is important, cats and dogs, everything is important. But ask yourself this right now. Detach from this. Let Leave them behind. Just you will be here. Just you. And the third and last point would be, I would invite you also to engage in the sense of like spiritual imaginations. Just you will be here, but imagine that like God is with you. After all that we've been experiencing, and this wonderful conference this week. How what now you imagine God? How are you going home with God with you? And who is Christ in your life? And how is Christ coming to meet you? That's the time we have right now. Right. Now let's take this moment. First to create this space, allow God to be here with us. Invite God to come here through Christ or with God. The way you engage with the Spirit, it's fine. Let leave everything at least out for a short time. Everything, everyone. Just have this time between you and your God. Now I'm going to invite you to come with a grace. What is the grace that you're seeking at this moment? With all that we've heard, we taught, we see, all that we've said. What is one grace? We can find from God.
Now we're gonna go on your finger in the first step on the, of the exam. You're gonna breathe with me. Breathe deeply with me. Let's go together. Go up and hold it. Hold it. Hold it for five seconds and slowly down. God is with you. You're in God's presence. And God loves you. And allow God to touch you. Allow God to give you a hug that you've never had. Many of us are walking, dealing, everything. Sometimes we feel cold outside. We don't have shelter because everything's busy, everyone busy. But God wants to give you a hug right now. Let you be squeezed by God and just, just look at him and he say, I love you because you are beautiful in my eyes. We're gonna go in second step right now. We're gonna breathe in very deeply. We pause, hold it on, hold it on, hold it on. Slowly down. Now look back on your day. Or look back on your week, perhaps on your year. Perhaps in five years. Usually, in our relationship with Christ, there are many layers in our life. Sin, as definitions, is the way that we means that we miss the mark. Maybe this morning, maybe last night or yesterday, this past week, a month, a year. Ten years back, where have we missed the mark in our relationship with one another? Where have we forgotten to make space for others? And what has been denied to us? And what we have been denied to someone else? Bring it right now here. The work of healing is a work of awareness. And how right now you are aware of God's presence with you. And God said, bring me all your sorrow, all your pain, all your difficulties, and I will give you rest. Come here right now. Just rest on God's hands. Give everything to God. He loves you. We're gonna go on the third part again. We go breathe deeply in. We pause. Pause. And slowly down. Now, if you have been given everything, ask God for one grace and be grateful. Ignatius of Loyola, on the spiritual exercise, it said, one of the sin and is a mortal sin of human and humanity is ingratitude. When we are not grateful, it's a sin in God's eyes. Now let us ask God forgiveness for the time we haven't been grateful. And on this space, in at this place. Let's say thanks to God for all that we have given. Our breath. 
more than ever in our existence, we've never seen some things which is a gift from God. Simply, breath was so challenging. And many times we have taken breathings for granted. Perhaps right now is a time we need to be grateful for our breathing from God. Because there are many, just like us, human like us, who have been denied of the simple gift from God. Let's say God thank you for the simple, simple gift of breathing that you and I, we can breathe today. If we can breathe, that's when we are alive. Like St. Damien said, those who are alive are those who are doing God's will and God's grace. <clears throat> Let's say thank you to God. We're going to breathe again deeply down, we go. We pause and slowly down. Now, after all that we have received, we have seen, we have heard here, let us God to be with us as He always been and give us the grace for tomorrow. No matter what happened in our life, we know God's love, it's God's hope and justice and healing. God will be with us. Let's ask God for the grace of tomorrow. No matter what you want for tomorrow, just bring it right now. Ask God for that. And we're going to breathe again, deeply, we breathe it down, we breathe. We pause. And slowly out. Kumbaya, oh Lord, Kumbaya, Kumbaya, oh Lord, Kumbaya, Kumbaya, oh Lord, Kumbaya, I would invite you to stand up, stand up. Come by here, oh Lord. Come by here. Come by here, oh Lord. Come by here. Come by here, oh Lord. Come by here. Bring healing, O oh Lord. Bring healing, O oh Lord. Bring healing. Bring healing, O oh Lord. Bring healing. Bring healing, O oh Lord. Bring healing. We love you, O oh Lord. 
We love you, O Lord. We love you. We love you, O Lord. We love you. We love you, O Lord. We love you. The only way we can fulfill all those grace we ask is when we come together as one. Now I'm going to dare ask you some things impossible as the work of healing and justice. I'm so sorry, perhaps some of you might feel uncomfortable, but the work of healing and grace is a work of uncomfortable. Jesus Christ was uncomfortable on the cross. If you want to engage in the work of healing, we have to engage in this path to be uncomfortable with each other. From now and then, let us all engage in this path where we can all engage with each other, your neighbors, your gaze, your talk, your hearing. Engage with those as if it's a work of prayer. Let everything we do, we say, we see, will be an act of prayer. One of the cardinals from Vatican, St. Ignatius, one later, he said, you know, I, those guys in formation, why do you ask him to study so much? They have to pray. Ignatius said, you know why? Let them study. Because study, the study has to be an act of prayer because we find God in everything. As we are living here today, each people you see, you hear, you touch, just bring that to your mind. Allow this encounter to be simply an act of prayer. It's okay if you're on your knee 24 seven. Bless you. It's okay if every day you're on the chapel, but if one you see, it cannot be an act of prayer, and ask yourself, why do I have to go to the chapel to pray whenever when I see my friends and neighbor is not a prayer? Allow everything we do be a way to bring us closer to God with be an act of prayer where we all can be one together. Let us engage in this work and forget the sins that we were enemies for each other. And remind, we're all of us being born, sent to be one for each other. I'm going to invite you right now to go. Be comfortable. Let us give a hug for every, to everyone in the womb. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Be comfortable. Go, move your step. Go, give a hug to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.